Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the session on information mobility for data acquisition. My name is Faraz Ravi. I'm a director for product management for, with a specific focus on point clouds and also the uh, point tools portfolio of products which came into Bentley last year. So um, everything is a campus. You've seen this image maybe a few times. I love this image. It describes very succinctly uh, what we're involved with. And it also illustrates how everything we start with involves existing conditions in one way or the other. We need to establish what our canvas is before we start an infrastructure project. And so existing conditions are very important for us. Whilst uh, existing conditions have such a pervasive implication for an asset's life cycle, uh, it's, uh, it's therefore critical that we achieve, oops, let me just put that one, that's correct. It's critical that we achieve information mobility, not just for design data, but also for data on existing conditions, um, in, with also a similar degree of, of integrity as we are able to achieve with, with design data. And I think this is becoming increasingly important as the ways in which we acquire data is changing with great advancements and innovations in technology. So here we can see three different innovations that we've seen uh, really happen over the last 10 years or so. On the right-hand side, a laser scanner, uh, now sub $50,000, sub 30,000 euros, or in that order, um, to, to acquire a laser scanner. In the middle, GPR, ground penetrating ra radar. And at the top, uh, uh, UAV, um, devices which can capture photography of a site and can capture existing conditions. And I think this really presents us with an incredible opportunity for achieving unprecedented efficiencies, but also poses challenges, challenges for information mobility with integrity. So I want to talk about how we are supporting the use of existing conditions of information throughout an asset's life cycle and meeting the challenge to provide information mobility with integrity. I'm going to focus on three types of existing conditions information acquired in the field. The first, point clouds, uh, geotechnical data, and also inspection data. So let's start with point clouds. Um, in case you've missed all the buzz around point clouds, I'm going to start with a 10-second primer. Right, so here we go. So point clouds are very richly detailed, accurate, usually unbiased models comprising entirely of points. It can be millions of points and can often be billions of points. And they're typically captured with laser scanning. So a point cloud can include color. It can also include intensity or black and white type values. And also other attributes per point, such as classification. Uh, they have numerous uses. And in an early stage or initial stage of a project, we typically uh, require site's geometry and the, the surrounding context for the purposes of planning or estimating. So this is where we're going to start. And the question arises, how can we model a project's surrounding context quickly and cost-effectively? Well, laser scanning and point clouds provide a very compelling solution to this question. This is a survey-type process that generates a detailed and accurate point cloud of a site. And there are a number of hardware solutions and laser scanning workflows for a wide range of project scales, from close-range, detailed design, all the way through to mobile systems that are capable of capturing multiple kilometers of, of road, for example, or rail in a, in a single day. Uh, at the initial planning stages of a, of a um, excuse me one moment, let me see if I can get this to run. Okay, maybe I'll just stop that. Ah, here we go. At the initial planning stages of a point, uh, at the initial planning stages, the point cloud can provide context that can inform massing studies or help us with line of sight or, or view shed analysis. With unbiased coverage, the point cloud will also include lampposts, trees, and everything which is which is within the site. It doesn't. It's not just biased to things which may be important to uh, a particular type of engineer or a particular discipline. It captures absolutely everything, and that's one of its real strengths. Now, if you were to build a vector model using a manual process, uh, going out in the field and taking observations and survey data and extrusions and creating a model, you would inevitably miss much of that detail. And so the ability that you have to do 
the type of detailed viewshed analysis, for example, or even massing study, uh, is not the same as you get with, with a point cloud. This is showing a point cloud directly within MicroStation together with a design model. So now that we have an accurate model of existing conditions, we can communicate this to stakeholders in a very effective way by using, by using movies. Let me see if I can get this top one to run. Yeah, there we go. So being a full 3D model, we can view it from any viewpoint. And this gives us a great advantage, because the initial question comes, well, why don't I just use a video camera? Well, it being a full three-dimensional model, having video-like quality, but we can have an unconstrained viewpoint. So that means we can get an overview of a project. It means we can enter areas which would otherwise be, be dangerous to access, uh, or maybe contaminated, let's say, in the nuclear industry or for disaster recovery. We can uh, survey disaster areas and inspect them from, from any viewpoint. So a little bit about detailed design and how point clouds also have applications through to detailed design. For many design projects, existing conditions uh, are, are critical, and in some cases, even a driver or a constraint of, of the design. So how can point clouds support design workflows. Well, this is a small example uh, of a design workflow which is directly impacted by the availability of, of, of a point cloud. It's a cathedral in London. Uh, sorry, excuse me. It's not in London. It's in England somewhere. Um, and you can see, unfortunately, quite faintly, but you can still make out the point cloud on either side of, of the design model, the geometry. So the designer wanted to replace the roof, but needs to do so with a great deal of confidence that it's going to get perfect fit and, and finish once brought onto site. Well, they're able to do that with a point cloud in a way that maximizes the amount of fabrication they can achieve and minimizes the amount of time spent in installation and in fitting uh, with a great deal of confidence because they've tested it virtually with an accurate point cloud model. Now, this is not a high budget pioneering project. This is just standard process for this designer this is how they work. And they're, they're simply a joinery shop that specializes in historic restoration. And it's feasible for them to, to use this process. So you can imagine on more complex projects, uh, it's extremely feasible and cost effective. So as fundamental data types within MicroStation VHI, point clouds can also be used as de design elements so in themselves. So here's a very compelling example. This is a factory floor that's being remodeled and various stock elements have been extracted from the point cloud and made into objects. What that enables us to do is perform a re-layout of, of that facility, of that area, entirely using the point cloud data. So here we're not using vector models at all, but we're recognizing that the point cloud is in itself a, a, uh, a model and a fundamental data type that can be manipulated in ways which we're traditionally accustomed to using vector models. Finally, we can also use point clouds for. Uh, mm -hmm. open to questions as we go along here? I'm happy to take questions as we go along, absolutely. Can, can we go back to that one, mm -hmm. please? <clears throat> and and which, which were the vectors? There are no vectors there at all. Uh, I see. Yes, yeah, entirely. Uh, it's entirely point cloud. So this was a study to determine could we use a point cloud itself as a model for design purposes, uh, not simply as a backdrop, but actually as design elements in themselves. So everything you see here is a point cloud. There is, there is no vector data there at all. But, but can you explain a little bit further? So mm -hmm. you have a point cloud model, and you're extracting a three-dimensional element from that and moving it to another position? A absolutely. So we have a point cloud model. Of course. So the question is uh, seeking some clarification um, on how this was achieved. And is asking, are we taking the, the point cloud model and extracting parts from it uh, in order to reuse them? Uh, did I characterize your question correctly? Thank you. So uh, that's abs abs absolutely correct. Let me go to the right position. This, for example, on the left-hand side, I don't know the technical term for it, cabinets, let's say, has been taken from elsewhere within the factory. 
has been extracted and created as an object, uh, as have some of the overhead beams and some of the other elements. They've then been recomposed, or rather just, just been used as objects and duplicated and positioned in order to create a, a, a mock-up of a new layout. And so to do that, you've actually got the x, y, z coordinates of the different parts of the, say, the cube and the model you want to take, and you just move that to a new position. Right. I mean, it's much more of a, of a user-driven process, where a user just... Recognizing it as an element. Is like right. Uh, exactly. So th this is still entirely composed of, of points, and the user has just said, you know, I'm interested in, in utilizing this area of the factory uh, and duplicating it over on this side, and has taken parts from, from this facility, or perhaps quite possibly another, and has used that to compose uh, a layout. So basically, for, you just click on the points you want, and then create the cube out of that, or the solid out of it, and then you do it. Right. Essentially, essentially. How, how, um, how do you get all the colored elements? Because for me, when you do some, for example, some, some lasers, mm -hmm. you get a gray <coughs> cloud. So, cloud so the question is, how, how do you get colors? Because often when you do laser scanning, yeah. what you get is gray points, which, uh, which is absolutely true. So many hardware devices today have built-in cameras or else they can support, uh, the process can support taking parallel photography, taking photography done in a parallel process or even independently and mapping that back to the point cloud. So it's just part of the original survey process. Um, the most streamlined version being, you, it just comes out in the scanner that way, uh, or else it being a case of there is photography being taken separately and it's been mapped on in the software process. This is very much a survey process, and then you achieve a color point cloud. This image, for example, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of cleanup before. Right. So this is this is laser scan uh, of this area. Likely, with this type of laser scanning, there may have been some noise and maybe been some people coming between and so on. So there's been some been some cleanup. I wouldn't say a lot of cleanup. It probably took an operator uh, 20 minutes, an hour or so, just to clean that up to make it to make it as clean as, and, and uh, uh, well presented as that. Um, this particular company have a very tight process when it comes to tolerances, and so they achieve very high quality of, of uh, uh, point cloud model. So I'm happy to continue taking questions as, as I run through. Thank you, Greg, for opening that up. Um, <coughs> we can also use point clouds, of course, for, for clash detection, uh, and this really has a great impact for us in the design process in, in that we're able to evaluate clash issues virtually, uh, not just between design models, but also between design models and as existing conditions. Now, we got very excited about clash and the fact that we can do it real time and extremely quickly, which is really unique. And so the examples you're seeing here are real time users pulling stuff around and lots of funky stuff is happening on screen. Um, which is very exciting. But of course, you can do this in a, in a static scenario. So we can have a static uh, design model, a vector, a, a vector model, a 3D vector model, and have a point cloud and determine what the clashes are statically. We can also do that point cloud against point cloud, which is quite unique. Uh, I don't believe anyone is doing that at, at this point. I've not seen it, a point cloud to point cloud clash. And we're doing it extremely, extremely fast, which is going to really open up a number of uh, different opportunities, uh, we believe, certainly in, in construction. So let's talk about construction, fabrication and, and construction. How can we use point clouds to mitigate construction risk? Well, there are a number of things that we can address. So point clouds can, can be acquired at regular stages during an asset's construction or acquired specifically for solving a particular construction problem. There are a number of problems we'd like to address. For example, recording and monitoring construction progress, comparing construction to the original design model to ensure that we are on track, to ensure that we're, we're achieving the original design intent. Uh, and also trying to mitigate risk when it comes to very tight installation problems, when it comes to uh, challenging um, interfaces between, between elements. Finally, if we're capturing data at various stages during the construction, this, of course, places greater demand on data management because now we have multiple data sets of the same facility, of the same asset, 
and data mobility becomes more challenging. But I will talk about that as we go through the presentation. So here's a great example from, from the UK. This was actually featured on a very popular television show in the UK. Uh, the house in itself is quite interesting in, in that it's the first passive house uh, featuring a lot of eco-technology uh, to be built in the UK. Now, the rear retaining wall was composed of very expensive prefabricated slabs. And the architect was greatly concerned that the site works may not have been exactly to plan, and that the prefabricated slabs, if they were out by even millimeters, would be extremely expensive to, to adjust. So the site was scanned during construction, and the, the slabs were uh, scanned at the, at the fabrication yard, and virtually the two were fitted together to ensure that they would get a perfect fit on site. And so a lot of the risk and a lot of the uncertainty associated with, with that project was eliminated through that process. And of course, that has implications for logistics. If you bring these things on site and they don't fit, uh, it, it, it causes logistical problems. It has, it has implications for, for a, a construction roadmap and so on. So it, it, it can be a real, um, uh, very valuable way of mitigating risks of installation. This is new technology that we are bringing and developing in Bentley Pointer's VA tie. And we'll also be migrated to the MicroStation platform. Um, and I think it's going to really greatly advance the use of point clouds for construction. It's the ability to determine the differences between two point cloud data sets. Now, if we're able to do this, it means that we're able to identify what changes have been made from one state to another, what has been newly constructed, what has been newly demolished, uh, and, and so on. So you're seeing this highlighted here in, in these images. Uh, this is, again, really fairly, fairly unique, and I think we are extremely well positioned to really leverage this technology for, for construction. So the green is the new and the red is the master? I believe so. It may be the other way. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. So owner-operators, for them, the benefit really is a smoother construction. Uh, it's one that's also closer to the original design intent. And as an asset is handed over, they're able to perceive detailed, accurate, as-built information and documentation. And so with the final scan of a constructed asset, we can generate this very detailed, very accurate as-built documentation. It captures all the design changes that have occurred during the construction process. Although we try to minimize those, they are typically inevitable in any complex project. The key thing is we want to capture them and understand what's happened. Finally, on to asset optimization uh, and operational life, the stage of the life cycle, which is, of course, where an asset spends most of its time. And an area of key interest for us in how we can uh, leverage point clouds. So many organizations are, are globalizing operations and yet centralizing engineering or centralizing management. A good example is uh, the Ford Motor Company. The Ford Motor Company uh, invested in scanning purely because they wanted to be able to remotely access virtually facilities that they have globally around the world. They have 30 different um, powertrain plants around the world, but they manage them and all the engineering is done centrally in Detroit. So how, how, uh, how do you manage that situation? Previously, they would send whole teams out to these various locations to survey, uh, come back, and it became extremely expensive to do that. It also, they didn't get the same fidelity of data and understanding of, of the facilities that they had. So with pressures uh, to minimize travel, with pressures to m maximize reuse of facilities and minimize the energy involved, point clouds are proving extremely valuable as providing an as-built uh, model of an existing facility. And of course, once you have that model, you can use it for security planning, event planning, space, uh, reorganizing space, identifying areas for, for maintenance, and so on. Um, these are also dimensionally accurate models, so you're able to determine ergonomic issues. You're able to uh, check volumes and measure distances and so on. So the question arises in the plant world, well, can I use this to, to retrofit an existing plant? Uh, 
these point clouds that we have in the plant world are, are typically extremely large, very complex, visually very complex and difficult to, to interpret visually without uh, expert knowledge. Well, in Descartes, uh, Bentley Descartes, we, we support advanced point cloud workflows and advanced visualization, which really simplifies the task of working with, with larger point clouds. You can see here on the right-hand side, just shading in different ways really highlights different features, and that enables the, the user to, to gain a, a, a better and clearer understanding of the geometry that they're working with. We can also work with different point classes. So in this case, we have, we have part of the plant we wish to replace. So within Descartes, we can select that part, just uh, place it onto a different class, hide that class, and replace that with, with a vector model. The key lesson being you don't need to vectorize everything. Uh, it's extremely valuable if you're able to and you have the tools to, as you do in MicroStation, work in a hybrid workflow where you vectorize what you need, uh, the proposed structures, and you leave the, the point cloud as is to represent the as-built structure or as existing structure. So here's another great example from, from Spec Services in California. It's a manifold. On the, on the top left-hand side, we have the existing condition. If we move to the right, we have areas highlighted for demolition. This is just being uh, highlighted using selection tools and recoloring. Um, on the bottom left, we have those points removed so we can see the post-demolition situation. And then on the bottom right, we have the design model dropped in. And of course, this is fully three-dimensional. What we're, what we're showing here are two-dimensional images, but we can inspect that from any angle. Uh, we can generate, we can generate even, even plan views from that, um, and so on. So is that running? Let's have a look if we can get this running. And as, as Bupinda showed earlier on, uh, it's also extremely valuable operationally to be able to check for clashes. If we, this is a real example in a car factory where they want to understand, want to be able to evaluate what is the implications of widening a vehicle for a different market, for example. So if we send a wider vehicle through this plant, uh, if it's, what's it going to cost us? Now previously, in order to do this operation, they would take a cardboard cutout. This is, this is absolutely True, and this is the state of the art today. This is the way it's done. They take a cardboard cutout and they run it through the facility. And that means shutting down the facility. That means um, uh, time to get those results. So if I, if I have a question, what's it going to cost me to have a, a, a vehicle which is 100 millimeters wider for the US market? Right, that question takes time to, to turn around. And I can't thrash out multiple scenarios. I can't look at uh, different configurations very easily without being extremely expensive. Here we can do it virtually, we can do it extremely quickly, we can batch the process so, such that we can have a hundred questions. It doesn't cost us more to have a hundred questions than it does to have two or three questions. So extremely valuable in the operation, uh, operational um, uh, field in, in the automotive industry and, and many others. So I've spoken, I've spoken about point clouds and and how we can use them throughout the life cycle. What I haven't really talked about is how are we enabling information to be mobile throughout the whole asset life cycle, and that's what I want to address. Um, Bupinda mentioned the FedEx example. This is absolutely true, and actually, I was at the heart of this, and I discovered this myself. Um, when, two or three years ago, working for Point Tools, we had customers that would have very large data sets and would send them to us via FedEx if they had issues to be diagnosed. That was a typical and standard process for getting data across an enterprise, for getting data moved globally. It was not, it's not possible to do it in any other way. Um, so as a consequence, it's very difficult to achieve data mobility within an organization for large, for large data sets. Now, Despite the fact that point clouds deliver great value throughout our assets lifecycle, as we've demonstrated, very typically they are acquired for a particular question, particular process, and thereafter discarded. 
due to the lack of uh, mobility that we have throughout the asset lifecycle for working with point clouds. So of course this is something that we're addressing and we have already addressed. So today Bentley users have the tools that remove these barriers to adoption for point cloud data and enable mobility. So on the left-hand side, let me start by talking about broad interoperability. We have extremely broad interoperability when it comes to laser scanning and point cloud data with almost every hardware solution uh, supported. So we can accept data from where we're entirely hardware agnostic. We also have support for point clouds across every single MicroStation based product. Uh, there is support for point clouds. You can already start working with point clouds within, within your workflow. Uh, iModels, uh, as Bupinda mentioned in his, his presentation, are very valuable, self-aware, uh, reusable models that also support point clouds. But one of the characteristics of point clouds is that they can be very large. So it's very typical to have multiple gigabyte point cloud files. Well, within iModels, the user is given a great deal of flexibility to determine uh, how much data they want to put in the iModel, what area of data they want to put in the iModel, do they want to decimate the data in order to keep the file sizes down, and so on. So very, um, we, we still maintain the, the portability of iModels. Mm. Decimate would be sample the point clouds and reduce the precision? Absolutely. So not so much reduce the precision, but we can downsample the point cloud. So I want to send an area of interest to, to uh, an engineer. Uh, that area of interest may, have, may come down to 200 megabytes of data. I don't want to send 200 megabytes of data. I'm able to downsample that to something more reasonable whilst maintaining as much detail as possible in the area of interest and, and embed that or contain that within, within an I model. Of course, with all the benefits that iModels come with and, and can, can include design data in there as well. And finally, project-wise point cloud services, which is a very significant step forward and I'd like to talk about in more detail. So, please Tom, go ahead. Um, yes, essentially. I mean, it, that, that's, uh, if I understand you correctly. Mm -hmm. so, so, Tom, you're asking is, is reducing the, the um, or decimating a point cloud within an I model similar or analogous to reducing the size of, of an image or a photograph? Cropping a or cropping. Of photo mm -hmm. and then just resampling it or right, so the. the Absolutely. So uh, a user has a choice to, to resample or crop or do both. It's obviously depending on, on the purpose for which he's creating the eye model. So if he wants to illustrate a particular detail issue, then may choose to crop it and may choose to keep the full density and the full detail. And that's, that's uh, uh, feasible given the size of the file that he's going to generate or may choose to do both or may choose to have an overview but to resample the whole thing down. And the analogy with photography is, is an accurate one. Can the resampling be intelligent? Um, it's technology that we're working on. Today, the resampling is, I wouldn't like to say not intelligent, because a great deal of intelligence goes behind it. But I think what you're getting at, uh, and the question was, can the resampling be intelligent? What you're getting at is, can the resampling perhaps choose geometry edges or choose something which would minimize the data but still uh, enable right exactly right so according to the geometry so it's an area of active research for us uh, there are a lot of different approaches for doing that um, decimating heavily on flat areas is good for some processes, but visualizing, visually very much compromises the visual clarity of data. So there are, there are, there are really pros and cons, and it's very application and, and, and uh, solution specific. But this is an area of active research for us. So where were we? Oh, yes. Um, so with, with project-wise point cloud services, we're able to stream point clouds into any MagStation-based session. And th this is really huge. And we do it very intelligently, optimizing 
data requests and really packaging uh, data for transmittal in a very efficient and optimized way. So this makes it possible for users to work with multi-gigabyte data sets globally across an enterprise and uh, not have to physically transfer media in, all, in, in order to do that. So although this is a huge step forward and a lot of innovation and technology has gone behind this, we very much maintain our approach of keeping point clouds as a fundamental data type. What I mean by that is from a user's perspective, it's an entirely seamless process. For a user, they simply go uh, to open a file and, and, and the, the project-wise dialog pops up. They, they select a pod file or a point cloud file and the data streams in rather than being copied, copied down and having to wait for a, a download process. So it really is extremely seamless and, and highly uh, streamlined process. So just a visual to, to illustrate that. Um, what we're able to do then is really eliminate duplication, eliminate all the rights issues, the integrity issues around duplicating and transferring data physically. We're also able to leverage project-wise's data management uh, features. And this is really key, because there are alternative approaches which involve parallel systems, parallel streaming servers and, and clients, and all sorts of additional infrastructure required for just working with point clouds. But we believe an integrated solution within, within a proven framework like ProjectWise is infinitely more, more valuable. It's easier to roll out in an organization. So here we're seeing data streaming as, as, the, view is changed, as the view is changing. And that's coming across a ProjectWise server. So this point cloud was, I think it's around one and a half gigabytes, something like that. So a one and a half gigabyte download on a, on a connection like that would typically take in the order of four or five minutes. Could take, could take longer. But you can see in that instance, the user within four or five seconds is able to start working with the data and get an overview of the data. And as he zooms in, more detail comes, starts to stream into the session. Um, <clears throat> if you get extreme, sort of right, so if you get into extremely large files, it, the, the mismanagement strategies that you use. So it's often more valuable to tile, let's say, a very large data set. And there, there's, ways around, there's ways around that. I mean, you can have a very large file, but typically, if, if that's the case, then you, you probably have users which are working on different parts of it. And it's just more efficient from, as an, uh, from an organization point of view and file management point of view to, to tile that, and that, that effectively deals with any constraints that you might have. And if you had quite a um, point cloud uh, heavy workload in an organization, so would, it be able to, would it be able to cope with multiple users streaming at the same time? Uh, absolutely. So we have um, a whole center, Lithuania, that just tries to kill these things <laughs> and throws hundreds of users at it and simulates extremely heavy load. So everything that we do in ProjectWise is, is, is really tested to destruction. And that certainly includes scalability, working with multiple sessions concurrently at the same time, and so on. Yeah. And they're brutal. Yeah. But I'll observe, uh, I think I happen to know that the technology to do this was first developed for large raster images. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then computers got faster so quickly for large raster images that it, it never really was called upon. Now. Right, it was a non-issue, I guess. So, so it's the same technology now, mm. the same look-ahead buffering and yep. so forth that's being applied now to a problem which in 3D it's hard to imagine mm -hmm. ever becoming an incidental problem. I, I think that's true because uh, with with two D the problem. I mean, I don't want to get into the science of it, but I'll spare you the, the detail. But there are there are reasons why in three D it will remain a non trivial problem that you just can't throw computing resources at it and use a sledgehammer to crack that nut. You, you do have to do it intelligently. But the analogy is absolutely right. I mean, essentially um, the way that organizations deal with satellite imagery, large amounts of raster data and the, and the ways they achieve efficiency there is very similar to, to the way that we work with point clouds. You were feeling all the metric about it. <laughs> <laughs> so
So am I going to get the next slide here? Force it. There we go. <laughs> so let's step back a little bit uh, where we started talking about point clouds, geotechnical inspection data with respect to information mobility. And moving on to geotechnical data. Um, let's look at this question. If, if we are out in the field collecting different types of geotechnical data using different devices, how can we manage these diverse types of data acquisition? And this could be data from boreholes, it could, it could be data from taken manually on a clipboard, uh, and, and so on. So GINT is a very powerful way of aggregating that data uh, from different diverse sources for analysis, and crucially for mobility. So we can take data from, from different sources, standardize the way in which that data is, is stored and represented, um, and use that for building information models, and also use that for geo, geospatial analysis, geostructural analysis, excuse me. And finally, of course, incorporate that into the design model, into, into the information model. Um, this is really important because that data, geotechnical data, is very typically uh, used to solve a particular problem at feasibility or planning stages and, doesn't, and suffers from information mortality after, after that event. In fact, it may even not be digitized. It may be kept on paper and so on. But the data is extremely valuable throughout the process. If we come up with issues during construction that involve geotechnical issues and geotechnical data, then ideally we want to be able to go back to that data, or even better, it's, it's, it's there live within, within our design model and we have access to it. Uh, we can't do that without information mobility. If we have a situation like we did on the, on the East Coast recently, where there's an there's a environmental disaster, at an operational stage of, of an infrastructure asset. We want to be able to go back and understand what the geotechnical conditions, uh, and that data can be very valuable. Well, that data is very, uh, quite often not accessible or not available because it suffers from information mortality. So the ability to, to move this data throughout the life cycle, to give it mobility, is, is really key in efficiency for, for our assets. So how, how are we achieving this? Well, Firstly, by broad interoperability. Uh, GINT can support data from numerous, numerous uh, software packages from, from numerous environments that are used in this industry. Um, live linkage, I'm going to actually hand over to Ron to sp uh, talk about in some detail. And Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. yeah, four years ago, uh, we acquired Gint Software. And so it's been part of our solution now for about four years. And we've been working on uh, building that integration into our other products and some of the foundations that I'll talk about in the next presentation that we uh, include in our open roads technology also find their way into things like Gint and help us to be able to move forward in what we're doing in that area. One of the challenges that you run into in the geotechnical world um, is, is all this information you collect. If you think about the fact that a person is taking a, a core sample, you know, 40, 50, 60 foot deep into the ground, most likely that 40, 50, 60 foot will never be disturbed, at least not by man, okay? And so you end up with all this data that's a high quality data for you that you really need a way to be able to, to find that data, to be able to reuse that data and it's very expensive to go out and take these samples in the field and collect all this data over and over again. So one of the things Bentley has done is really done a great job of bringing this, this sample information, which may be lab tests, may be sample, may be observations in the field, and bring this information into a, a geospatial environment. So we've integrated Gantt with uh, GeoWeb Publisher. 
And in doing this, we give that, um, that intelligence that's scalable so that when you look at um, from a distance out, you only see projects. And when you zoom in on a project, you get individual data. And you get data that's located intelligently enough that you can go in and touch on an individual um, sample hole and draw that information out, or you can grab it by selection set and grab 15 at a time. Now, imagine that you're in a city and you're trying to do some new um, uh, work in that area, maybe site work, building work, and you can go in and see immediately the type of test that you have, uh, whether it is just a core sample or whether it's a real um, um, driven sample that you got some good um, information out of, and grab that at any time and look at that in a web browser. Now, if you can expose that information across the, the internet, the extranet so that everyone can get to it and produce it in an HTML file, then you have protected the provenance of the data and the geotechnical engineer is happy that no one is, is, making, <laughs> is violating their data, but at the same time you can give it to the general public. And then with GeoWeb Publisher, you can do thematic mapping that allows you to do uh, how much rock. That red symbol that you had there on the rock was how much rock was in that hole? How deep are my holes? Do I have exploration deep enough for the new building that's going to go or high rise that's going to go into that area to deal with that? Everything is color coded so that you get the right types of samples. You see everything visually, effectively, immediately upon that. You can query individually on that. You can pull up the original test data that was collected, and you can even pull it up in the lithology column of bore logs that were originally generated for this project, or even come up into the fence diagrams or profiles that were created as well. So all your geotechnical information, including the entire geotechnical report, is available through a spatial query in a device that is simple, easy to use in a, in a web browser in order to be able to use that information. So it really adds a lot of power to the geotechnical to the engineers that are support that are dependent upon the geotechnical engineers and be able to give you all that information and you'll see that you can each pick just a project and only see the data that's available in only that project to be able to do that so anything you can do in a database geospatial query we've now enabled into the geotechnical world and if you've ever spent days in a in the basement of a building trying to find a report from 10 years ago or 30 years ago, you can't imagine how much I appreciate this being the old dog in the room and uh, having done this uh, this digging and for. Gene? Uh, so, GIMP is running in the background here? Okay. Uh, so the, the question is, is GIMP running in the background? Okay. And what we have done is provided a wild, uh, a live link into the GIMP database. So if the uh, GeoWeb publisher is looking at live data in a database across uh, the um, uh, portal uh, through ProjectWise, so that you've got all of the data management that you need within that and all the security that you need within that environment, and then the GeoWeb publisher is simply reassembling the data and giving it to you. And actually, this interface is absolutely user-definable so that if the user wants to be able to see um, uh, tables on the right and lithology on the left and different things like that, then it's completely user-definable so that you can get what you want to disseminate to the user. that address it, Gene? Yeah. Tom? The, the question is, um, this implies that this is a municipal, data, uh, municipal database that any user can get access to. Uh, the, da the data typically resides in the consulting firms that had it originally, unless the um, local um, municipality required the data to be delivered to them, and you kind of get a mix of yes and no of where they require that. Some, some of the municipal, uh, local governments or DOTs or uh, state agencies um, don't necessarily have the expertise to want to own the data. Some do. Now, we currently have um, a, a medium-sized um, Department of Transportation, Mississippi DOT, that is taking this technology and they're taking all of their existing bore data and putting into um, the, building the links um, between GeoWeb Publisher and Ghent and are uploading all their data so that all users all across the state so every contractor that comes in can come in and look at all existing data and determine whether they need to bring in more geotechnical investigation or whether enough already exists to be able to plan their project and do that.
So it's a mix of yes and no. This is an emerging technology. You don't see this happening a whole lot yet, but every time we show it, people go, wow. And because this is intelligent information that we are managing in Ghent, it is, it is depth down the hole with intelligence associated with it. We, are, we do produce the I models uh, from the geotechnical database as well. So that when you start looking at a project um, that is large in expanse and you need that stick column going down a hole, what we call a lithology column, you can actually produce that in an I model that then can be shared throughout the enterprise and everyone can have it in a, a immutable model 3D and touch on that and, and just seek information on it and it publish the information about that hole in there. Now typically when you do that part, you don't take the lab data, you just take the physical data that was observed in the field. Uh, don't have it in this one. Come to the next one, next presentation, I'll show you. If the, answer, the question is can you create um, subsurface models out of the data? Yes. And that, that is part of what you do uh, in this whole process as the geotechnical um, engineer. And um, there's a whole discussion. Uh, we can talk for hours on that. <laughs> okay, inspection side. Now, um, it was asked earlier, was um, Ghent owned by Bentley Systems? Absolutely, we acquired that. Um, that was announced at the Charlotte uh, B Inspired, the last time that B Inspired and B Together were at the same place in Charlotte a few years ago. Uh, that was when, again, one of, our, one of our most recent acquisitions is Inspectech. And um, throughout the world right now, and, and we really see the heat in the states on this, uh, on this item, uh, it's, it's about risk assessment. Uh, in the transportation world, we talk risk assessment uh, uh, rather than risk, of manage, risk management. Uh, they're really the same thing. But one of the things that we're real concerned with is, is the reliability, the liability, and the capability of our existing aging infrastructure, especially bridges. Inspectech is a company out of Pittsburgh, um, was a company out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania that we acquired in May of this year. And they provide a uh, very significant tool, a set of tools in being able to go out and inspect bridges and some other objects as well, add that to the asset database and then it becomes part of the asset management that you have for your entire life cycle of the project that you're looking at. And they actually have the tools within the InspectTech range of tools to be able to rate the inventory to know that whether your bridge is still rated as a, as a good, safe, one that needs rehabilitation and maintenance, or one that maybe you ought to start limiting some loads on. So it's all tied in very tightly with, um, with that whole uh, risk assessment that you do in the bridge environment. Uh, it is a um, um, very much a, kind of like a thin client type um, uh, capability. It is um, not, it's not one size fits all in this part of the market. This is strictly a software as a service. Because in this case, when you're looking at bridge inspection, what a county needs versus a state agency versus a government agency or what a consultant may want to use, their demands are absolutely different. Their needs at different times upon the products. If you're a state agency, you have a continuous inspection program going on. You're always updating and feeding information. If you're a consultant, I got a big job here today, nothing for months, a big job. And so software as a service really fits into this environment very well so that you pay as you go and you actually uh, uh, use this. And it's, and it's built through, um, uh, all the access is done through um, web browsers. Um, the forms are usually built to meet the state agency or the uh, um, uh, federal agency requirements within this so that you get a look and feel that meets exactly into what you're doing. You have specific reports that are required depending upon the government agency that you are dealing with. Uh, the question is, is this a database? This starts as information and is a database, okay? Now, there are analysis tools built into it, but the analysis are based upon risk, uh, not necessarily upon uh, load. However, in, in a lot of the agencies around the world, that risk 
and um, load analysis have kind of crossed the the um, the paradigm to one another because you, you may you can go and inspect a bridge and say look this this bridge was rated at uh, x number of tons or kilos as you go in there but because of the deterioration it's dropped from an a to a c so you start looking at how much you reduce it now that's not a true structural analysis but it's based off of experience of what's happened to your bridge um, as you've done that and, um, and it's all about the reporting, it's about the data management, it's about the asset risk um, evaluation, it's about presenting the results to the client or to the people who are interested in this, and the information is served up for anyone that the system administrator wants to make, um, uh, wants to have access to that. Many of the US DOTs that are doing this actually allow a certain amount of this information available to the public. Yes. The, the question is, is um, uh, the risk assessment or risk evaluation is done, uh, what is the matrix of uh, determining the level of, of deterioration or problems with the bridge? And um, in the United States, um, AASHTO, um, the uh, American Association of State Highway uh, tr uh, Transit Authorities, uh, the Transportation Authority, um, Organizations, I'll get it right here in a second, uh, they have built a rating system that all of the U.S. states look at for bridge rating. Okay, other countries have similar. Uh, some of the um, South American countries um, look back, um, look to see what the U.S. has done, and and base some of their information off of that. Canada has a very good system. I'm not as familiar in Europe and Asia what the existing systems are in that, but it it is um, a rating system that has been, been developed over many years of experience. And once a bridge gets down to a certain level in that rating system, then this information is taken into products like Superload, LARS, which are bridge evaluation programs from Bentley Systems. Uh, Ashto has their own Ashtoware uh, tools. Pontus used to be called Pontus, now called um, BRM, uh, Bridge um, Maintenance. Um, and those programs do actual structural analysis and give real uh, quantitative results rather than subjective results. Okay? And that is what I've got. <laughs>